Hello, everybody. My name is Jeanette Pierce, and I'm going to be your tour guide today. I'm the founder of the Detroit Experience Factory, and today's tour is the Women's History Along the Riverfront, sponsored by the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy. Uh, so let's tell us a little bit about our two organizations. So the Detroit Experience Factory educates locals and visitors about the people, places, and projects in Detroit using immersive storytelling. We've taken over 130,000 people on experiential tours of Detroit since we were founded in 2006. And now we've pivoted to offering virtual tours of all kinds. And as you'll see, it's actually a pretty cool uh, new idea that we've had to uh, do the, over the last year. And it's sponsored by the amazing nonprofit Detroit Riverfront Conservancy, uh, which is responsible for the establishment, improvement, operation, maintenance, security, programming, and expansion of the Detroit Riverwalk and associated green spaces. Through its public-private partnership, the DRFC will support the development of the Riverfront District and facilitate community access uh, on access to the waterfront because the riverfront is for everybody. Hashtag bring everybody. So a little bit more, hopefully you're on this riverfront tour and you know a little bit about the Detroit Riverfront and the Conservancy. Uh, and we're going to be talking about different places uh, along the riverfront, of course. Uh, but there are just so many different amazing spaces that they've created. And the riverfront, the river walk will eventually be five and a half miles from the Ambassador Bridge to the Belle Isle Bridge. We have about uh, just under four miles completed uh, at this point with a series of parks along the way. Uh, the nonprofit was actually started in 2003, founded in 2003 by civic community and public leaders who took the lead in putting together a plan to develop public space on Detroit's historic and international riverfront. It recently just won again uh, the number one riverfront, uh, river walk in the country. And so that was just last week. And uh, the amount of public spaces they have, just some that are pictured here, uh, include the Dequinder Cut, which we'll be talking about. Uh, you can see um, the river walk itself, the Mount Elliott Park with the splash zone, Cullen Plaza, and the new uh, Valade Park as well. So we'll be going along the riverfront and seeing some of these. But if you haven't had a chance to get out and experience the amazingness that is the riverfront uh, or haven't done it lately because it's always changing, then put that on your list and the weather's warming up in time, uh, warming up so you can do it now. And then just a little bit about myself. I'm a lifelong city of Detroit resident. I grew up on the far east side. Uh, I moved downtown in 2003 and I started this organization in 2006. And today I'm in Lafayette Park with my husband and two-year-old triplets who hopefully you won't be hearing in the background. But if you do, eh, you know, it's a women's tour. What are we going to do? So let's start with some Detroit history and get, uh, get the ball rolling. So Every part of Detroit history, every story around Detroit history should begin uh, with talking about indigenous people and the role that the river played in Detroit's history. And so it's we hear a lot about uh, the Europeans and we'll talk about that, but the indigenous peoples uh, here in Detroit have been in Michigan, they say for around 10,000 years, their estimates are. And then at least uh, in Detroit, there were settlements going back at least a thousand years ago. And then uh, this is a map by a really great website, Detroit Urbanism. Blogspot.com. And Paul does all sorts of great uh, resources. Uh, and uh, he actually plotted the different uh, tribes that were here uh, around the time that the Europeans were arriving. And so you have the Wyandotte Fox, Potawatomi, Ottawa, Loops in Miami. Uh, and then later, what we saw was that the Anishinaabe, which was uh, the Ojibwe, Oda uh, Ottawa, and Potawatomi, uh, came together as the Anishinaabe, which means the three fires. And, but I mean, Wyandotte, Iroquois, Fox, Miami, Sauk all used Detroit's riverbanks as a place to hunt and gather together, again, for hundreds and probably thousands of years. And just really quick today, Michigan is home to 12 federally recognized and four state recognized tribes. Uh, and we have almost 100,000 Native Americans living in Michigan. And there's a, a really great organization, Detroit Indigenous Peoples Alliance, that we'll talk about a little bit later. But, uh, and then this on the picture on your right is of the first Wyandotte village. And this was drawn in 1732. And this is where we're actually gonna go get a little taste of the virtual tour because this was in the location on the Detroit Riverfront uh, and we'll just go to where um, Joe Lewis Arena and guess what 
used to be. So if you haven't been to Detroit lately, or if you've never been, we have some visit uh, folks from out of town joining us, uh, then you might not know that Joe Louis Arena is where the Red Wings played from 1979 until just a couple of years ago. And it is right here on the Detroit River. Uh, and this is the location of that Wyandotte village. Uh, and right here, so they would have been looking out, um, probably a lot more trees at that time, but just across the river. Uh, and this is why uh, the river is so important. Also just fun, here is Joe Lewis Arena or what was left of it. So you can see this is what it looked like in 2011. And we're gonna get to do this with other places on the map. Uh, and so, I mean, 1979, it was built, this is a little aside, sorry, but you know, on the just beautiful river, with no windows. So never, not really appreciating that. Uh, and then they started tearing it down uh, just a couple of years ago and poof, no longer there. Uh, so we'll be interested to hear what comes next for that area. So that is this uh, drawing of the Wyandotte village is, was, right, lo was located right there. Then of course the Europeans arrive and the flag of Detroit here on your left is actually tells the story of the Europeans uh, presence in Detroit. So it has the fleur de lis on the, in the lower left-hand corner for the French when they arrived in 1701. And then the British take over in 1760. And then of course the Americans with the stars and stripes in 1796. And then the city steel is here. It has two women with flames behind them. And that represents the great fire of 1805. Uh, and our motto uh, comes shortly after that, which says, Speramos meliora, resurgit chinaribis, or we hope for better things will arise from the ashes. And we have literally and figuratively done that many times in our history uh, on this land. Uh, and women especially, uh, I feel like have to continue to uh, face challenges and get back up and keep on going. And the women that we're gonna talk about today have absolutely done that uh, time and time again. And this uh, drawing on your right is of what is we call the ribbon farm. So when uh, you can see the fort in the center and then these strips of land that are numbered. And so many of these were um, what we call ribbon farms because the French idea was that instead of one person just having all access to the water and it all comes back to the river, right? Uh, that uh, you'd have these long narrow farms where everybody would have some access to the river. And some of the owners of these properties, uh, you might uh, know, might find familiar because they're names of the streets that we have today, like Rivard, uh, De Quinder, and Saint Antoine, Bobienne, uh, and so forth and so on. So that is the uh, the whole ribbon farm. All right, so now it's a little bit of Detroit history 101, uh, but let's talk about now women's some of the women in Detroit's history and and include and then come on up to today too. So. Um, one of the first women uh, that we're going to talk about is Madame Marie Therese Cadillac, uh, and she was the first uh, European woman to come to what is today Michigan. Uh, and she was actually born uh, in Quebec in 1671. She was married uh, it, at the age of 16 in 1687 to a guy who came to be known as Cadillac. That's a whole nother story. You know, he was a he kind of like made up his name, made up his titles, uh, and um, it worked out for him, I guess. You know, he became uh, a pretty big dude for a while, but that's a whole nother story. Uh, so uh, they lived in what is now Nova Scotia. And uh, and then um, and, and Antoine Cadillac, uh, we'll just shorten it to that for now, uh, was at uh, Mishimilac or Mackinac. Uh, and then wants to come and to this space that we now know as Detroit. Uh, so he heads out, he arrives on July 24th, 1701. Uh, where does he arrive? He arrives, let's hit, hit uh, just go down the road here uh, and why don't you do, come back out. And he arrives at what is, what is today Hart Plaza. So uh, we can go on the river walk here. Actually, we'll go on at water here, let's see, we'll go, let's see, we up here. So here we are at Hart Plaza. And actually we can zoom in. This is a statue of Cadillac and the historical markers here uh, about, and it's in French on one side and English on the other, uh, about his uh, landing here and founding Fort Pontchartrain du Détroit. Uh, Pontchartrain was the guy who paid for the trip and made it possible uh, in France. 
and, uh, and Detroit meaning the straight or the narrow. Because funny thing about the Detroit River, not a river. Uh, so it is actually, all right, this is where we'll zoom out a little bit here. We'll get rid of Joe Lewis. It is a strait and then it connects two fresh bodies of water, that fresh bodies of water being Lake St. Clair and Lake Erie. Uh, and so if you haven't ever, you always see the bigger map of Michigan, but uh, it is a strait here that, and it's also how uh, Canada kind of gets south of us, which is kind of interesting. There's a wonderful map at Cullen Plaza that shows the waterways here. Uh, and so you have Canada, of course, north, but it's also south of us. It's the only place you go in continental United States, you go south to get to uh, Canada. So, uh, so this is, and he chooses the narrowest point between the two land masses at that point. Uh, and then uh, just uh, a little while longer, uh, he, so he sends word to his wife, hey, I made it, I'm alive, which was definitely not a foregone conclusion and says, hey, come on over, come on in, the water's warm, join me. And he specifically wanted his wife and child at the point to join him to prove that the settlement was a suitable place for family life. Uh, and so despite some protest, uh, in September of 1701, Madame Cadillac sets off for Montreal in a canoe, along with her nine-year-old son and uh, of the wife of Cadillac's lieutenant, Madame de Tonti. And the group arrive at Fort Pontchartrain in the fall of 1701. Uh, and as we mentioned, the first European women to set foot in Michigan. Uh, and at the settlement, Madame Cadillac took on many responsibilities and, and administrative duties for the settlement. She hired voyagers, signed contracts, served as a doctor to the 200 ha uh, uh, inhabitants and neighboring Native Americans. <clears throat> Her husband was recalled to, twice to Quebec and during his absences, she would maintain interests. So she basically ran <clears throat> the fort while he was gone. And all this, mind you, uh, while having 13 children, uh, most of which whom were born in uh, at Fort Pontchartrain du Détroit, uh, and sadly, four of who four of which who died at a very young age, um, basically one at a few days old, one at a year old, one at two years old, and one at four years old. I mean, the tragedy, you know that. And when we talk about women in history we frequently hear about um, you know, the loss of children or the loss of pregnancies. And, and it's something that you know, is easily frequently just, oh yeah, oh, by the way, her kids, you know, she had children who died. And that's, I think as, yeah, as a woman, as a mother, I think it's so important to recognize um, that they were going through all of these things um, that their frequently more famous male counterparts were going through, but also uh, while experiencing childbirth and and frequently the death of their children. So it is uh, just really tragic uh, that she lost her children here, many of them here in Detroit. But she still she remained here until uh, with her husband until 1710. And, uh, and then eventually she, well, they go to Louisiana for a little bit, it's a whole thing. Uh, and he becomes governor of Louisiana, but then she, they returned to France and she lived there until 1746. So, uh, so not just a, a pretty face, again, um, extremely important uh, in the creation of and survival of this fort that later grew into the city that we know today. <clears throat> um, and the Detroit Historical Museum and Detroit Historical Society has tons of great information about a lot of these uh, great women that we're talking about today. Uh, and it has this picture of the diorama uh, of her arriving here, which I think is kind of neat. Um, but it wasn't uh, just white women that were having an impact. And this is the thing, whereas we're talking about the other tribes that were here, of course, women were an integral part of that. And unfortunately, we there isn't a lot of, um, records of uh, women, of indigenous women that were, you know, having such a big impact on our region along the riverfront here. Um, but there is one that comes a little bit later, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and that's Sarah, or she went by Sally Ains. And she was actually an, uh, from New York, and she was uh, of Oneida. She, uh, she was an Oneida woman who moved her trading business from upstate New York 
around Poughkeepsie, I think, who move uh, in around 1775. So it's about to be the American Revolution's about to start. Uh, and she comes to Detroit and she expanded her business. She was trading in furs, cider and other goods and became, and that's when she started being known as Sally Moore. She purchased a house and a lot and then uh, the lot was only 16 feet wide. So the following year, she bought a neighboring lot for a total of 32 feet. The 1779 census though, says shows she owns cows, horses, and 100 pounds of flour. In 1787, she sold her property in Detroit and actually moved uh, and acquired even more land in present-day Chatham, Ontario, just across the river. She had a house built along with farms, an Indian cornfield, and an orchard, uh, and continued to trade in the Detroit region. Uh, region, but she also performed important political work in serving as an ally, a liaison, and messenger to Joseph Brandt uh, during the Northwest Indian War. Uh, and she actually participated in negotiations leading up to the Treaty of Greenville, which is uh, pictured here on your right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and so in 1794, she actually was part of these peace negotiations after what was known as the Battle of Fallen Timbers. So this actually painting. Um, my Howard Chandler Christie is of Miami Chief Little Turtle presenting a wampum belt to General uh, Anthony Wayne, as in Wayne County. So this um, is actually pictured on the county seal. So if you actually go to um, just a little bit away from uh, the river, uh, we'll actually we can go to see right in front of the Coleman A. Young a young municipal center, uh, there's a little statue you might've heard of called the Spirit of Detroit. And you've probably seen it a million times, but uh, this time, next time you see it, I want you to look at what's behind it, the city seal, which has that motto, we hope for better things will arise from the ashes and the county seal, because of course it is our county building. And that is <clears throat> Chief Little Turtle and General Anthony Wayne signing the Treaty of Greenville uh, after the Battle of Fallen Timbers, which is uh, just outside of Ohio. So again, a woman, I mean, who knows? Uh, I mean, there's also lots of great stories about her, um, you know, trade being a liaison, trading with uh, Native Americans and making some of the uh, British uh, officers bristle with, um, you know, a woman doing this and a woman doing that, but they, they still needed her. So they, they couldn't cut her out completely. And so she was also integral to uh, the peace and relationships between uh, the British at that time uh, and, the, and then the Americans and the Native Americans here. And, and this is her signature actually. And it says it's her signature and, uh, and mark in a petition that she signed in 1792. Uh, so we don't have a photo or obviously, or even drawings of her. Uh, but that is what we have of Sally. So again, amazing women that we likely haven't heard of or don't hear enough about that uh, that are part of the lineage of Detroit and all of that, you know, and all focused, of course, on and along the riverfront that we walk around on today and that the Riverfront Conservancy is doing amazing stuff, but this history is right beneath our feet. Um, and other historic heroes, uh, one is Lisette Denison Fourth, and so it's um, un not known by most people, but there we did there was slavery in Detroit, and Lisette was born into slavery in 1807 uh, in in the 1780s, and then escaped and crossed into Canada in 1807, and they had there was a. Uh, a law that you could establish residency and gain your freedom. And then if you came back uh, years later to America that you could continue to be free. And so she came back to Detroit in 1815 and lived free. And she worked um, for many prominent families in Detroit. Uh, and she had a close relationship with many of her uh, employers and, uh, and actually invested her pay in land. And so in 1825, uh, she purchased 48 and a half acres of land in Pontiac, Michigan, uh, becoming the first black property owner in the city and maybe even in all of Oakland County. Uh, and not just first black woman or first woman, but first black property owner. And there's actually a historical marker, which you can see here in the middle uh, that is still there today. And it's um, actually Oak Hill Cemetery. 
And we'll give you, um, we'll provide links to everybody too, of, of like a map of the different places that we're talking about, uh, where you can find some of these, whether historical markers or uh, modern day uh, businesses and things that we'll be talking about later. Uh, but most famously, she and one of her legacy, her biggest legacy was that um, in 1831, when, while she was working for Mayor John Biddle, uh, she actually worked for him for 30 years. And he moved down river and, uh, and was one of the helped create the city of Wyandotte. Uh, and, and then also she spent time by in Gross, on Grosseal at that point, and she attended Old Mariner's Church in Detroit. So uh, where is that? So uh, not only did she cross the river to freedom, I mean, her whole life, I mean, most of people's life around at that point in Detroit was uh, all along the river, right? And so this, it, you might've seen this little old church right here is the uh, Mariner's Church. And it is called because and it was actually, uh, we could spend all, this would be another part of the tour, but we're going to run out of time. Uh, but it was two women who actually uh, commissioned this church to be built in 1849. It's our second oldest church building. Uh, and Lisette Dennis and Forth was a member here. And it was commissioned so that sailors, people could come while they were in port without having to pay to own a, um, a bench, basically. Normally, you'd have to pay X amount of money to uh, to have a pew that has your name on it. That that's where you sat, uh, and if you didn't, then you couldn't come. So this, they wanted to make it open, and so she was inspired by this to uh, do something similar uh, downriver. So after when she had accumulated um, a lot of money, and when she died, she left it that her uh, in her will that much of her estate was to be used to build an Episcopal church where rich and poor could worship together. And it was used to construct at the time this little uh, church, St. James Episcopal Church in Grosseal. Uh, and it is still there today. So we can, this is one of the fun parts about the um, doo -doo -doo, virtual tours is that we can just pop on over to Grosseal. Uh, if we were in in-person, it would be a lot uh, more difficult to do that. So if you don't know where Grosseal is, it is down the Detroit River um, past Bois Blanc Island, which some of you might remember as Bobolo. Uh, and it is, uh, or just by there. And it, on this side is the actual historic church. Uh, and this is what it looks like today. So they had just this little chapel and then they built onto it, but it's almost, um, you know, unchanged from over 150 years ago. Uh, which is pretty amazing. Uh, so an, another just amazing entrepreneur, businesswoman, and philanthropist uh, in Detroit that we should know the name of. And another, um, I mean, and this is one of the most amazing stories. I feel like that uh, we just keep throughout, throughout these virtual tours and through the women that have done so much amazing work that uh, it really is, you can't make this stuff up, you know, like, or, but wait, there's more uh, because they just continue uh, to, you know, the story, you're like, oh, that's cool. Oh, they, and this is how I kind of felt um, whenever I read about Laura Haviland. So uh, Laura Smith Haviland was a Quaker born in, uh, uh, in, uh, in New York and no, in Canada, sorry, first, then she went to New York. Anyway, so the thing, but we're talking about Detroit in the river. So I'm going to skip through it so we can cover more. Basically 1832, she co-founded here uh, the Logan Female Anti-Slavery Society and the Raisin Institute. Uh, so it was one of the first anti-slavery, this is 1832, one of the first anti-slavery societies in the state. <clears throat> and then the Raisin Institute, which became a safe space for African-American fugitives uh, and freedom seekers and attracted uh, black settlers in Michigan. And so she did all this work then. And then in the spring of 1845, and man, is this hit home even more now, there was an epidemic that killed six members of her family, including both of her parents, her husband, and her youngest child. And she was also sick during this, but she survived. So at 36, she found herself a widow with seven children, a farm, and the Raisin Institute to manage. Uh, and in, despite all of these personal losses and challenges, she continued with her abolitionist work and in 1851, she helped organize the Refugee Home Society in Windsor, Ontario, right across the river, uh, where fugitive slaves were settled, uh, church and school were erected for them. Each family was given 25 acres to farm. 
And she was at the same time, the Underground Railroad, what they called superintendent in Detroit. So she worked with George de Baptiste uh, and William Lambert, who we talked about on our previous tour, which you can still find uh, on the River uh, Front Conservancy's a Facebook page, as well as their YouTube uh, for a little while longer about black history along the riverfront. Uh, but they were the president and vice president and she was known as the superintendent of the Underground Railroad. And so throughout the 1840s and 50s, she traveled between Michigan, Ohio, Canada, assisting freedom seekers uh, in escaping, teaching African-American students and making public anti-slavery speeches. Uh, she was, I mean, she did so much stuff like it was, absolutely amazing like she went down down south even farther southern slave owners had a three thousand dollar reward for her capture and dr taya miles author of dawn of detroit uh, which is an amazing book about the era of slavery in detroit and the underground railroad uh which you should definitely check out uh, said that women were not expected to be independent and involved in political issues at this time. And there was a lot of criticism of her from fellow abolitionists and that she was seen as someone who outright rejected the conservative gender roles. And uh, again, you could do a whole book. And in fact, there is a whole book on her. Uh, but later in life, she was also actively involved in other social causes, advocating for women's suffrage, helping to organize the Women's Christian Temperance Union in Michigan. And she died in 1898 at the age of 89 years old. Uh, and the amount of impact she had uh, and just with all of the challenges she's faced, um, I mean, even later after like the Civil War, she was... I mean, she was involved in so many different pieces, um, but her biggest uh, role is her role in the Underground Railroad. And you can see this monument here, which is known as the Gateway, uh, which is named the Gateway to Freedom Monument uh, by Edward, by Ed Dwight, who is the sculptor. And this is uh, right along on the Detroit Riverfront. So let's go back, let's head back downtown and, uh, and see where it's at right near Hart Plaza. So if you've locked, walked along the river walk, um, you've likely seen this amazing monument here. We can go right there. There's the Detroit Princess. Uh, and here's the Gateway to Freedom Monument. You know, they estimate around 40,000 freedom seekers came through uh, with the help of um, Laura Smith Haviland and, uh, and many others working together, black and white and different religions and everything to, uh, to get people to freedom, mostly in Canada. Um, and there's actually a sister monument. So there's the Gateway to Freedom Monument, which was um, created for the 300th birthday of Detroit, uh, uh, of the 300th anniversary, I should say, of uh, Cadillac Landing in Detroit. And so this is, and if people have questions, you can put things in the chat. Uh, and Davy, I should forget to mention, Davy from our team is also is answering questions. Um, and also, um, let's do this, the Freedom Tower. No, that's not what it is, Tower of Freedom, there we go, <laughs> right here. Um, and then I'll have, we'll have time for questions and conversations at the end, okay? We so this is the matching uh, part, and many of you haven't probably had a chance to get over to Windsor and see the matching monument. So you can see the same people that are depicted there are depicted, um, you know, coming and make making it to the other side in this Freedom Tower uh, here in Windsor. And we actually do a Windsor virtual tour as well, and there's a lot of great stuff over there uh, that uh, hopefully soon we'll be able to go back and visit. Um, so anyway, look up, some, read some more about Laura Smith Haviland. Uh, just absolutely amazing. Um, another uh, historic hero is Fanny Richards. And we're kind of moving up in time here a little bit. Uh, the Fanny Richards um, was Detroit's first black school teacher. And she was born to free parents in 1840. But from an early age, she, uh, the Richards, her parents realized the necessity of an education and uh, the fight it would take for her to gain it. She grew up in Toronto, studied in Germany where she was influenced by Willem Fordabel, I'm probably butchering some German, who was developing the concept of kindergarten, uh, 
which we all certainly know about now, but uh, was not known in the United States at that time. And so after permanently settling in Detroit, she was allowed to teach in Detroit because of her brilliant scholastic record. And in 1863, she became Detroit's first black school teacher. She opened a private school for black children and in 1868 was appointed instructor of colored school number two. Uh, and she was one of a number of Detroit leaders who opposed the idea of segregated public schools. So similar to, similar to, similarly to slavery, we also had segregation here in, uh, in Detroit that again, we don't hear about, we hear it more, a, um, uh, more of a Southern thing, but nope, we had it here too. And so in 1869, after an intense campaign, the Michigan Supreme Court ordered the Detroit Board of Education to abolish separate schools for black and white students. And Richards was transferred to the newly integrated Everett Elementary School where she taught for, wait for it, 44 years. It was there that she established the first kindergarten in Michigan. So not only is she our first black school teacher, not only did she open a school for black children, uh, but she was the taught established the very first kindergarten in, in the entire state of Michigan. And then in 1915, she, after more than 50 years of service, she re finally retired from, from teaching. So it's also amazing that these women have ha had such long lives at a time when that was also not very normal uh, and with their impact just continued to grow because of that. Um, and she, her achievements were not limited to education. She helped to found finance and became, became president of the Phyllis Wheatley Home. Uh, for aged colored ladies, an institution organized in Detroit in 1898 to meet the needs of poor and uh, the poor and elderly. She was also a founder of the Michigan State Association of Colored Women, and she taught Sunday school at the historic Second Baptist Church for over 50 years and um, is buried in Elmwood Cemetery. But her home site is just off of the uh, Riverfront, as you might guess. So actually, we're just going to go there. So it is right here. So if we go to Cullen Plaza, which also this is hilarious, and I um, this is a Google Google's awesome. It's allowing us to do a lot of these things as Google Maps, but they're not always right. Uh, for example, this little title here that says West River Walk is wrong. This is the East River Walk, Google. Uh, so maybe we need to have a, a campaign about that. And this is the, the Cullen Plaza, formerly known as Rivard Plaza. Again, remember back to the Ribbon Farms. And if we just come down Rivard here to Larned uh, but, and near Lafayette, and we can put our little guy right here. And this is the Fanny Richards home site. So just a few blocks off the riverfront um, right here uh, between Larned and Lafayette. Uh, and that's where she lived while she was doing all that amazing work. Okay, so a name now uh, that uh, this is a historic hero too, but maybe in a different way, uh, but also a name that you might be familiar with. I would hope you'd be familiar with. Um, but Aretha Franklin uh, is obviously um, one of Detroit's most famous women uh, artists, I mean, women period, and also an amazing artist. Uh, and it was actually just off the DeQuinder cut in 1956, which, uh, well, which would have been the DeQuinder cut as a greenway is new, but it used to be a railroad road track. So it was, it has always been there uh, or been there for a very long time. And it was a 14 year old Aretha Franklin made her first record uh, at the JVB, uh, for JVB records at New Bethel um, at located at 4210 Hastings Street. So um, both of these, Joe's records, um, which again, we talk about a lot more on uh, our, uh, our previous tour. And we also have um, upcoming tours around the history of racism in Detroit, where we go more into depth about Black Bottom and this area that is today Lafayette Park, but which was um, Black Bottom and Paradise Valley. Uh, but if we go up, so, and the highway uh, really demolished or did demolish a large part of the neighborhood, specifically Paradise Valley. So right here near, um, the, so the DeQuinder cut comes up uh, and to Mac. And if you just popped over, uh, this is where near the New Bethel um, church would have been originally, as well as um, the Joe's records. And you can see here, it says Joe's records, recordings by Reverend Franklin, because her father also recorded uh, 
speeches and things there. Uh, so just off the riverfront into Quintercut where she recorded her very first album, uh, a record. Uh, and now, uh, well, and she went on, that was her first record out of 75 million records sold worldwide. Uh, so that's pretty impressive. And now she has a permanent spot on the Detroit riverfront in the Aretha Franklin Amphitheater. So uh, the Aretha Franklin Amphitheater, formerly known as Shane Park, is one of just the most outstanding venues uh, in Detroit. Ima look at this. You can imagine listening to an amazing performer with the uh, river in the background and the wind blowing through your hair. Uh, and uh, after she passed away in 2018, they uh, immediately renamed it the Aretha Franklin Amphitheater, uh, which just is so fitting. Uh, and uh, and she also, you know, was a big, very active in the civil rights. She was so much more than just a musician as well. We could and should do a whole tour just on Aretha Franklin. Um, but uh, we are really proud to have Aretha Franklin Amphitheater here in Detroit. Okay, now uh, let's talk, let's get to, we're moving up to modern day here, uh, but we're still along the riverfront and we're going to talk about some great small businesses and artists and just uh, some great women that are making the riverfront uh, awesome today. And one of those is Kelly Cavanaugh of Wheelhouse Detroit. So just down the way from Aretha Franklin uh, Plaza, we're going to go back to uh, what is known as Cullen Plaza uh, on the East River Walk. <laughs> um, and this is where uh, the, the Wheelhouse Detroit is. And so Wheelhouse Detroit opened in 2008, shortly after uh, Rivard Plaza opened, which was really the first major um, park along the riverfront. So just chronologically, you have um, you know, General Motors uh, put in a lot of money to uh, re renovate the GM Plaza promenade here, which is amazing, uh, and kick off the first part of the Riverwalk. And that 2008, you have Cullen Plaza, Rivard Plaza then, uh, and then Wheelhouse. And this was, you know, so uh, Kelly, who is a, is a friend uh, and has been around a long time, she has um, done... She's worked as a freelance writer and she's worked into community development. She's been a bartender sometimes and actually frequently all of those things at this at one time. Uh, and then she opened this in 2008 with her friend Karen, but she's now the sole owner. And uh, she went through the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program and she graduated from University of Detroit Mercy. Uh, and she served on, as a board member of the National Bicycle Dealers Association and helped organize the Tour de Trois from 2005 to 2016. And if you aren't familiar with the Tour de Trois, it's an amazing annual bike ride uh, that normally kicks off near the train station in Corktown. And Vikings had uh, a lot of big surge in recent years, uh, though it's always been a part of Detroit and, uh, and Detroiters mobility. Uh, and it's just gotten a little bit more attention lately, but she certainly was one uh, of the people, again, a very long time ago, pushing and promoting uh, and making it accessible for bike riding in Detroit. Uh, and, um, and so you can see here the picture of, uh, and one of the things I love about Wheelhouse, so you can buy bikes, you can rent bikes, they'll fix up your bike uh, as well and tune up your bike. And I love that they have a variety of types of bikes. Uh, so they have, you know, these three wheel bikes, they have bicycles built for two, if you want to feel like you're, uh, you know, in the threes company opening and you're riding down the riverfront in a, on a bicycle built for two, you can make, she can make that happen. Um, and, uh, and you can see, we'll just like some of these other pictures here uh, that they have. So inside, they have all sorts of accessories, cool t-shirts. Uh, I mean, everything you need to be able to um, have a successful and fun bike riding experience in Detroit. Um, and they're even right now um, doing free service pickup and delivery, getting ready for the season. So get in on that. And she wanted to make sure, uh, like I told you that they're reopening for the season April 2nd, okay? So um, that's gonna be great. It's not that long away. They normally do these 
a series of big public tours all throughout the summer, but with COVID they've scaled back. Um, they are only offering small private tours, uh, bike tours, which are amazing. So if you want to get in on that book now, uh, but they hopefully, hopefully we'll get back to some public tours in, uh, this summer. And it's really uh, a women, it's not just uh, Kelly, five out of six employees, including owner, manager, and mechanic are women. And they've been named America's best bike shop six years running uh, by the National Bicycle Dealer Association. Uh, and she is she's just one of those people that is always, if there's something going on and you need help, she's always there to help uh, and has been involved in so many projects throughout um, the last 20 years now, almost in Detroit, uh, that if Kelly's involved, you know, it's good stuff is happening. And we're really lucky to have her and to have such a great resource like Wheelhouse Detroit uh, in, in the city. And it was actually one of the first, the first new bike rental shop. There's a great place on the east side, an old school, uh, long time business called Bike Tech. Um, but one of the first new businesses, uh, bike businesses in Detroit at that time. And now uh, there's lots of people doing bike stuff, but none of them are as cool as Kelly. And if she gets back to bartending uh, post COVID, that's actually a really fun time to, to chat with her. <laughs> um, so, okay, so we're on Wheelhouse. We go back here. So this is where Wheelhouse is. Now we're gonna uh, scooch up um, the, the DeQuinder cut and talk about some art. Uh, and one of my, my favorite artists in Detroit right now is Sydney G. James. Uh, and this is an amazing piece on your right that she did in 2018 along the DeQuinder cut. So if you're not familiar with the DeQuinder cut, uh, the DeQuinder cut is uh, a now two mile greenway that connects the riverfront to uh, and through Eastern Market. Uh, and then it's part of a larger statewide trail called the Iron Bell Trail, which is a whole nother story. Uh, but it, again, so this is where we're at. Here's the riverfront. You have Millican State Park and Harbor, which is really great. Uh, and here's Aretha Franklin Amphitheater. And then so you just come uh, from, you could park at Rivard or Cullen Plaza at, and uh, get on a bike uh, from Wheelhouse. You can rent a bike and then you hit the DeQuinder cut just down here. Uh, I'll show you the entrance to it. Uh, so here's the entrance to the DeQuinder Cut and here's the Outdoor Adventure Center uh, and here's Millican State Park, right? Um, and then you, you can go anywhere, you can go up and through and there's tons and tons of art. So one of the things is that there had been, uh, oh, we'll go back in time. So what was, what was it like before? Yeah, so this was an amazing project, the Outdoor Adventure Center. Um, and Linda Walters runs that, who's another amazing woman. And we can't wait for it to get back open post COVID. Uh, but this is what we're talking about, uh, the DeQuinder cut, what became the DeQuinder cut here. And the first segment opened um, in, the, uh, in, what was it, 2010? What year is it, 2009? Uh, and then the most recent segment, just a couple of years ago, uh, time flies, I feel, I blame it on the triplets. That's my excuse too. I'm like, oh, that was just yesterday. And then it was really five years ago. Uh, but you can see the transformation too here of the Outdoor Adventure Center, which they say this was originally a dry dock uh, ship building company uh, that they saved this exterior wall. Anyway, so you hit the DeQuinder cut and because the DeQuinder cut was abandoned uh, for so long and because it's an under, um, uh, you can see some pictures here, right? So you're, you know, it's below ground, uh, then it was actually a spot for, uh, for muralists, for graffiti artists, because you wouldn't really get caught. You could see and you could, you could do a lot of different stuff uh, without people seeing you and so you'd have time to do murals. And when the Riverfront Conservancy uh, was working on creating this greenway, uh, they weren't like, oh, cover up all that old uh, you know, graffiti. They recognized that graffiti and art uh, is actually a draw for a space, right? And so they have actually added to it uh, every year as well uh, by hiring many artists to paint murals, including Sydney James. So. Uh, as you scroll through here, you can see the many different, uh, and this is actually, if we could just turn right here, you would be able to see this amazing piece, uh, which again, Sydney James uh, created um, 
in 2018. It's called Date with Destiny. A little bit more about Sydney James. She's a native Detroiter and College for Creative Studies graduate. She began her career as an art director in advertising, moved to Los Angeles, worked as a visual artist in film and television, earned her master's degree in secondary education, which is just amazing, and then came back in 2011 and immediately started making her mark on the local art scene. Uh, if you haven't seen her paintings yet before, you probably just don't even realize that you have that you have because she's uh, now up to at least two dozen murals uh, in just the last few years in Detroit. And besides um, Detroit, she's created public murals in New Orleans, Atlanta, Los Angeles, Hawaii, Long Beach, and Ghana, uh, and is a recipient of the prestigious 2017 Kresge Fellowship Award. And she is my, again, absolutely amazing, my favorite artist. And I love the, um, the just color and vibrancy and use of this space because it's actually underneath this is a bridge like people are driving above this so let's go see where actually that is at so the dequinder cut has um, a few different entrances right so you can enter here um, at the at atwater street then you can uh, also enter at lafayette you can see here there's a, a spot right there that goes down and then you can also enter or exit obviously uh, at Gratiot and then up at Wilkins Street. And so Wilkins Street, which now is uh, here in Eastern Market. And if we go put the little guy right here, you can see uh, this is uh, the Dequinder Cut Freight Yard, which is an amazing public space uh, that has um, a bar, has you know food and beverage options, and they can do pop-up events all the time, again, managed by the Riverfront Conservancy, and it's really great space to spread out and be safe uh, in public, but uh, uh, six feet or more away from people. And right, if we had x-ray vision, we'd look right underneath this, and that is where uh, this piece is. Uh, she also has uh, pieces right uh, down the street here and uh, throughout uh, the Eastern Market as part of the Murals in the Market Festival. So if you're not familiar with Murals in the Market, it is an amazing project uh, that um, again is and can be its own separate tour uh, and they um, have, paint have curated the painting of 150 murals uh, over the last five years in this Eastern Market District. So um, so just in this spot, sorry, right around here, around Eastern Market and, and here as well. And so uh, she has a couple pieces as well. And one of them is right here. That, uh, doo -doo -doo. come back, sorry. Um, Let's try this again. It's down here, down this way, I think. Yeah, this way. Yes. Oh, it's right here. Uh, there's Tylon Sawyer, who's another amazing artist. Um, yeah. There we go. And this is on the uh, Cutters, which is an amazing uh, small business. But uh, it's a really uh, powerful mural that says the definitive list of everything that will keep you safe as a Black being in America and there's nothing on it. Um, and so uh, lots of inspirational pieces that she does uh, around the city, uh, including this one and another one of my favorites. Another artist is Wheezy uh, and you have de you've definitely seen hers uh, and her, uh, her name is, she was born as Louise Chen and she goes by Wheezy, Louise, you can kind of uh, do that. And uh, she was actually born and raised in Santa Monica to Shang uh, Shanghainese parents and is uh, best known for these large scale floral mural installations, which can be seen in public spaces throughout the United States from museums to public parks. And they often depict site specific plants and animals and the techniques are uniquely informed by her education in drawing and printmaking. Uh, and she says her affinity towards botanical subjects continues to grow and stems from an early introduction to George O'Keefe and fond memories of picking figs with her grandmother. So she's actually re relatively fairly new to the medium because she started painting after graduating from University of Cal California, Santa Cruz, where she majored in drawing and printmaking. And uh, she currently lives in Detroit, lives and works in Detroit and has 40 plus murals in Detroit. And one of her favorites was done uh, is part of murals in the market. So we'll come back to this one on the Quinter cut, but look at this, here's 
Cindy James. And actually here, again, Tylon Sawyer has a great exhibit at the Nanamdi Center right now. Um, and George Nanamdi of the Nanamdi Center uh, says is that Tylon Sawyer is the kind of uh, his favorite current artist uh, in Detroit. So uh, that is no small feat. But look, just right here, you recognize these flowers? Uh, so this is the um, one of the murals that she did for uh, the Murals on the Market Festival, and that she says is one of her favorite murals. And just because we can, uh, the difference of uh, what a lot, some people, and hopefully not anyone on this tour, but some people, you know, oh, it's it's just art or just it's just some paint, you know, what difference does it really make? Uh, and it makes a huge difference um, it, to a lot, you know, to the neighborhood, to the community, to uh, people coming. I mean, they become destination spots now, but people will come and uh, and then they might go to cutters and uh, support small businesses and they'll enjoy the river walk and all of these things because of the um the many murals that are here as part of uh and that's part of as part of murals in the market but that's also a big part of why the riverfront conservancy is uh so adamant about having amazing art for people as they walk run bike along the dequinder cut uh, and riverfront so this piece you can see is under underpass uh, and it's actually actually partnered with another um, artist, Stacy Adamic, Adamichik, uh, and this is called Organic Variables of Growth. And uh, besides Detroit, Wheezy's murals can be spotted in Mexico, Shanghai, New York, Aspen, and Raleigh, uh, as well as Atlanta, San Diego, and Miami, just to name a few. And uh, we are lucky to have her called Detroit home. And even if you're not a big on, big on art or like me, like I don't always remember, you know, every artist though I'm getting better at it, uh, but you can't, you can't miss uh, a Wheezy mur mural, that for, that's for sure. That's, they're just beautiful. So one of my favorite stories and women uh, leaders in Detroit is Amy Peterson and Rebel Now. And you're like, well, how's, how is she gonna connect this? Well, what happens when you have old paint, right? Um, uh, like it, if you've ever had an, seen an old building or if you've been on the Dequinder cut, you'll actually see um, paint chipping. Uh, and so it was the Dequinder cut that inspired Amy Peterson to, as she would see paint like this, uh, falling down to the ground, chips of paint and like this. And she would actually collect them. Uh, and she had this idea to make jewelry out of them. What? Like who comes up with that? I, that's not what I think about, you know, but there were just the different colors and the different shapes and, and, uh, and so, but it's not just about having, making jewelry, which is awesome. And you can see some examples of that, but her goal was actually to find, um, to be able to start a business, a social enterprise, uh, because she was volunteering and working and living nearby COTS, uh, which is in a great, uh, which is a great organization in the city that supports uh, people in between homes. Uh, and she was talking with women and they're like, well, we really need to have a job so that we can, you know, which we might've had before, you know, there's all these, and many of them were victims of domestic violence. A lot of, uh, sorry, there's a lot of stuff we can talk about and I'm looking at the clock. So uh, so short story is she hires women and uh, teaches them how to make jewelry and then they make it. Each piece is 100% unique and designed by, uh, by the woman who's making it. And they provide wraparound services too, like financial literacy and childcare, which as you know, if there's mothers out there, especially during the last year, uh, we know how important childcare is to be able to actually, uh, you know, get some work done and, and or anything that you need to get done. Uh, and so they provide that uh, and, and a whole bunch of other services. And now they have grown and grown. Uh, and it's all because of the art on the Dequinder cut. Uh, and now they make pieces from all over and they have their own little space. They actually, speaking of Joe Lewis, they work partnered with Joe Lewis as they were tearing everything down to create um, jewelry from the paint, the red paint and Joe Lewis. And they have bridal parts now. I mean, just look at this. You also can do, uh, they have great workshops where you as a group can make things. Uh, it's, it's just really amazing. So they have things for men, women, and they just launched this women's, um, book too. So you can support Rebel Now and get discounts at uh, 
over 30 different women-owned businesses and support those uh, women-owned businesses too, including uh, Detroit Experience Fact. You can get a discount too. So absolutely amazing. Um, another, uh, I'm almost done, but another really amazing small business that is in this uh, vicinity along the Riverwalk and uh, to Quinder Cut is Savvy Chic. So, so this is what's going to be fun, right? How many of you are going to like jump, you know, come down, or if you're already down here, walk or ride your bike or, or stop and get a bike from, um, uh, from Kelly. And then you ride up to the Quinder Cut, you see the awesome murals, and then you stop at Savvy Chic. So uh, you can just get off at Gratiot or Wilkins and then come up uh, and see Chef Savvy Chic. And actually I have this little video of Karen herself. I'm Karen Brown, and this is my Detroit. This is my store, Savvy Chic. I've been located in the Eastern Market for 22 years. The market started off with meats and produce. Over the years, they've added stores. We started off with antiques, gradually moved into tabletop and candles and linens. We've added a coffee shop and we added clothing. So we've kind of grown along with the market. One of the places that makes Detroit home for me is Savannah Blue. It's a lovely restaurant. It's off the beaten path, but it's not to be missed. It doesn't get as much notoriety as it should. Every time I go, consistently, the customer service is good. The food is good. My favorite at Savannah Blue is the catfish. Well, that just makes us hungry, right? So, um, but anyway, you can just see a little bit of Karen uh, talking about her space, Savvy Chic. And uh, and she, um, like she said, she, so she actually grew up here in Detroit and then she went and moved to California for a while, married kids, div then came divorced, came back, um, bought and rehabbed a home in Boston Edison. She's just one of those most amazing people that her and her now ex-husband owned, um, uh, a bar restaurant that kind of became or jazz club that then became more club and dancing and in, in, uh, in LA. And so she kind of has this just super, she's just one of those coolest people that, you know, and a lot of people thought she was crazy opening a business it, off the beaten path. You know, she, Oh, where's the foot traffic? And she said that if you do it right, people will come. And that is the truth. If uh, She's expanded three times and doubled its space from the original 800 square foot storefront and grow, fr growing from home interiors and antiques, like she mentioned to include fashion. Uh, and then in 2016, she partnered with and helped another woman entrepreneur, Monica Isaac, open Cairo Coffee inside the store, which offers a rotating selection of roasters not readily featured in the Detroit area. Uh, so unfortunately, due to COVID, uh, they obviously have not been, uh, the coffee shop was closed, but they are doing, uh, you can go to Cairo Coffee uh, on Instagram and or Facebook, and they you can get their really special beans, and they're actually doing delivery now. Uh, and if we just really quick go on the street here to show uh, where Savvy Chic is and the cool little mural here, and you know, let's just pop back in time a little bit. Um, to, you know, so you, where, what it was before. So you can see the little tiny space uh, here uh, in 2007, even until more daylight uh, and what it was, you know, so you can see why people might've thought she was crazy, but, uh, but when you have a great product and you have, uh, you know, what she has, then you're gonna succeed. So continue to grow uh, and change and uh, is back, is open today. So get your mask and uh, check out Savvy Chic. Uh, okay, and then really quick, I just want to do, because we're running out of time, but we talk about uh, Heart Plaza as one of the major spaces for all of the festivals in Detroit, uh, and it's such a, you know, huge part of our culture uh, to have these festivals, and one of the biggest is the Jazz Festival, and I wanted to give a shout out to, as we're talking about women that have impacted the riverfront, to uh, Gretchen Carhart Valade uh, and her role in the Jazz Fest uh, right now. So real quick, if you're not familiar, the Jazz Fest is the world's largest free jazz event. It attracts about 300,000 people to downtown each year, like obviously not during COVID. And then in March, 2005, uh, when the, uh, the pre a previous sponsor pulled out, 
when there was talk of maybe the jazz festival not happening, uh, Detroit philanthropist and also Mac Avenue Records chairman Gretchen Villade emerged as the major sponsor of the festival and uh, which led to the festival actually expanding in all aspects. So its new footprint expanded from beyond just Hart Plaza uh, here, uh, down Woodward Avenue uh, to Campus Martius. And that uh, has been a great addition and expansion. Uh, and uh, and so she has been become the uh, kind of the muse, if you will, or the, you know, the, the person that can make it, make, that is ma making it all happen. Certainly not by herself, of course, and she uh, hates getting all the attention about it, but, uh, but she has always just, she took her love for jazz uh, and has really made it, uh, made it impact the, the city, the region, um, and created the Gretchen C. Villade Endowment for the Arts, and, uh, and also opened the Dirty Dog Jazz Cafe in Gross Point Farms in 2008. And one of my favorite story about her uh, is when somebody in Gross Point asked her about that, she, you know, oh, you're opening a jazz cafe? And she said, aren't you afraid of bringing in the wrong element? Uh, and she responded, I think I'm speaking to them right now. <laughs> and she was so mad, you know, I just, uh, and it is an amazing place. Uh, and she said she's loved music and jazz her whole life, Louis Armstrong, Eddie Condon, all that. And you also might recognize the name Valade because of Robert C. Valade Park, which is uh, down on the uh, riverfront. And that was her husband. And he was uh, the uh, big fan of the Detroit River and local lores that he used to ice skate across it to Canada with friends. And the Bob's Barge is named after him, which is uh, to honor his time spent as, uh, with a drink along the riverfront. And uh, so let me just show you really quick. We'll end at uh, Valet Park because it is uh, the newest addition to uh, the amazing Detroit Riverfront uh, with awesome uh, winter programming that's been going on. Uh, but then any season, they have amazing things for kids, uh, grownups, beautiful views, the beach, uh, and also um, uh, Smokey G's Barbecue and Geisha Girl restaurants inside here that are open for takeout anytime. Uh, and definitely, especially with it getting warmer, uh, get out there and check out uh, Valet Park. So on that note, uh, I want to say thank you to everybody for uh, joining us today and thank you to the Detroit Riverfront for inviting us to have uh, to do this tour. Uh, I'm going to uh, give you some information about DetroitRiverfront.org for information, event schedules, or to donate. They are a nonprofit, uh, DetroitExperienceFactory.org to donate, book a tour, or check out our resources page. We have lots of great resources and we can book, uh, do all sorts of private virtual and then later in-person tours. Uh, but in general, I hope you learned something. I hope you uh, have now you want to go and support some of these great women owned businesses. And hopefully, if you ever forget about how strong women are and how big of an impact they have, even despite the many challenges that we have faced historically and even still today face, uh, just think about some of the women that have been able to do amazing work uh, and uh, on the, that you learned about on this tour. So on that note, uh, does anybody have questions? Uh, we're gonna go, I'm gonna go to the chat and see if we have questions from anybody that we missed. Um, and you did a couple of where's any visitors? Uh, so Shannon Brody says murals in the market and all the businesses and murals are awesome. Other than driving or walking on your own, you can book a ride in a two seater bike attachment with someone biking for you. I did this a couple of years ago when some coworkers who have physical impairments still wanted to join our team social event in Eastern market. Absolutely. Uh, lots of ways to see it. Uh, and, um, and also now with virtual tours. So we can really like, as you can see, we can pull up, we have an art and architecture tour and we can do a murals in the market. Also Jason Hall uh, and Ride Detroit does um, some great uh, in-person and virtual tours. Um, and uh, Detroit, uh, Davey was talking about uh, Detroit su suffered many cholera epidemics in the 19th century. Uh, I hear, I see a raised hand there. So let's see, uh, whoever was that? I, Lolita, was that you that raised your hand? Go ahead and ask a question. You're gonna put it in, just put it in here. Okay, thank you. Thank Hi, you. it was an accident. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, what did you think? Did you learn something new? 
I, you know what? I didn't know any of those. Um, very interesting. Um, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not a person of many words, but no, that's great. I was yeah. captivated the whole time. Um, I appreciate it. I'm so glad. You. Uh, and so just also a couple other things coming up. Um, the Dequinder Cut Spring Cleanup is on April 24th, and you can register for that on the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy website, which we can show here. Um, so there's lots of great resources. So everything we talked, or a lot of the places that we talked about, Riverfront, things to do, ways to help. Um, so let's see if we got this here, um, you can volunteer in lots of different ways. Uh, and the Dequinder Cut, uh, learn all about the Dequinder Cut and everything uh, here on the riverfront. Uh, and then we didn't even get to talk about Ralph C. Wilson Park, which is gonna be coming soon. So, um, but yes, volunteer, donate, all of those things. April 24th, put it on your calendar. Uh, and then also, I, I did forget to mention, oh, I mentioned it, but I could have done a whole nother thing on Geisha Girls, uh, which is a, uh, an amazing uh, sushi restaurant inside of uh, Robert C. Valet Park here. You can see some of these pictures. Guys, we, we don't have a ton of sushi in Detroit proper. Um, and so this is a really welcome addition uh, and again, they're open and you can get, um, and it's a great woman owned business as well. Question from Facebook. Um, how was slavery here different from the South? Um, I mean, I guess that's a, a bigger question and I'm not the super expert on it. Um, I mean, obviously we didn't have the larger plantation. So you did have smaller uh, frequent, you know, smaller number of enslaved people. Uh, but I think that the bigger the bigger point and in um, Dr. Miles book, here we go. Uh, so again, this is a really great book. Uh, so you can read about it. But, um, a Chronicle of Slavery and Freedom in the City of the Straits. And there really wasn't actually much talk about um, slave that we had slavery in Detroit. A lot of people just assume that we didn't. Um, and even, you know, historians, many historians until, um, you know, a couple articles. And then this, she wrote this book just a few years ago, which you can get at Source Booksellers, which though not on the riverfront is an excellent women's, uh, women-owned bookstore. Um, but I guess I would defer to the experts on, on that. But I think the important thing part is recognizing that we did have it and how that still impacts us, how that impacted post-slavery. Because even after it was outlawed, uh, technically in the Northwest Territory, we still had slavery. Uh, and names like Macomb, Woodward, uh, John R. Smith, our first uh, mayor were uh, enslavers of people. And we can, we do talk a little bit more about the, the longer term impacts of that in the, in that, in the history of racism tour that we have coming up on uh, Saturday, I want to say the 27th, and that's on our website as well. Uh, does anyone have any other questions on, I'll look on the chat here. I'm going to stop sharing and it might make it easier. Tuning in from Windsor and can't wait to visit Detroit again soon. Same here. There's also a lot of great stuff in Windsor. You might, I think part of this is to help us realize that there's a lot in our own backyard that um, we don't always know. There's always more to know, just why Detroit Experience Factory exists uh, and uh, and why, you know, it's so important to, uh, to have these, these and many conversations. All right, is there any, I'm gonna check on Facebook really quick to see if we have any other questions. If not, we can uh, wrap it up for the night. And again, this will be available on the, uh, right here on the Facebook page for Detroit Riverfront Conservancy, as well as um, on their YouTube channel once we uh, get it downloaded, uploaded, all that in the next couple of days. Uh, but please don't be a stranger to Detroit Riverfront Conservancy or to the Detroit Experience Factory. Uh, we actually have an uh, entire tour on our website about uh, the past, present, and future of the riverfront. And we'll be doing those again in person this summer, which we're very excited about safely with masks and all of that. Um, 
<laughs> Facebook question to end the night. How are you doing with triplets? Well, uh, it's, the fact that we did not hear any um, meltdowns while I was doing this tour is a good thing. Uh, and I'm doing great. I'm very, very fortunate. We can do a sh show a picture here. There's my guest, Gia Marina. And uh, I'm very fortunate that I've had, you know, one of those silver linings of the challenges of the pandemic are I've had, they turn one on March 22nd and they'll turn two on this coming March 22nd. That's how it works. So pretty much this entire year of the pandemic, I it's a magical time to spend with, you know, one to two. Every day is a new, new step, but then words, then everything, you know, and so to be able to work from home and have that extra time with them uh, and is, is, is magical. So it is uh, awesome. And it's, we're, it's all the kids that we have and we're all we're going to have. I like Sam, so Detroit, we assembly line babies, but I'm bumped, you know, mass production style. Uh, so, uh, so it's, we got to get all the cuddles in that we can. And, uh, and again, the silver lining of the pandemic, more cuddles with babies. Plus I wasn't going to be going to Europe or doing anything really fun or exciting like that. Uh, during this last year and, and no one else can either. So there's not a lot of FOMO <laughs> happening, um, but you'll probably see us actually on the Riverwalk. I live in Lafayette Park, right off the DeQuinder Cut. And you might, if you're on the Riverwalk this summer or around downtown or in Eastern Market, look for us in our triplet stroller. It stands out, I'll tell you. Uh, but that is the, the, one of their favorite places and we're so lucky to live uh, in such a walkable space and they, and uh, I'm so glad that the Riverfront uh, Conservancy and all the work that they do to make it an amazing space for families uh, and for everybody. So, uh, so bring everybody and maybe, and we'll see you on the Riverfront. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great night.